In the mid to late 90s, the independent scene was big. It was it was just different in so many different cities. So in Boston, what was yeah. what was the independent vibe like? Because we hear about the New York or the LA or the Bay Area really or the oh, South. It was dope. It was dope. You had Diff Records. My man, shout out my man Pete the Gov. Um, he's one of the pioneers of like putting out, he put out all the acrobatics early stuff was on him and I was, you know, uh, a lot of that Mr. Lift stuff too, early Mr. Lift and acrobatic, um, Sea Ray's Walls, Breeze Ever Flowing, a bunch of these guys who were like, became underground legends, were signed to Diff Records, and which was a local, you know, a cat that we all knew here in Boston. So the, um, you know, the, the mid nineties was good because then you had this next generation, the acrobatics, the lifts, the, um, Rex's terminology, static. Uh, you just had a whole new crop of younger generation hip hop and it was all good. It wasn't like BS. It was good stuff. So it made me proud and it made me like word. Now we got, we got more people to come on this, you know, New England, Boston, Massachusetts stuff, man, because, you know, for a while it was just me and uh, made men, you know, waving the flag for Boston. You know what I'm saying? Up until around 96, 97, 98, somewhere around there, where you had a lot of these other newer artists coming. Right. Okay. And then uh, one of my more interesting interviews or times I talked to you was with the Truth Hurts album, which came out in 2001, uh, yeah. be before the September 11 attacks, because uh, on Too Much to Live For, you talk about I keep it moving like Osama bin Laden. So exactly that came out way before the terrorist attacks. So what was it about him that you had been paying attention to or that you knew? So Man, yeah, listen, I'm all about, you know, world, world world events and what's going on in the world, man. not just, you know, in your little block and locally. So I've always been, you know, uh, about pretty much everything, man. <laughs> like I'm interested in a lot of different things. So um, politics and of course, um, you know, what what's going on with, with Osama bin Laden and the, you know, the bombings that he was doing and he was making a lot of noise, but, you know, it was here. It wasn't, to the point where everybody knows him like now, but he was, you know, doing his thing. So I was just paying attention and I knew that the U S was looking for him for a while. So I thought it was a slick line for whoever could get it, you know, keep it moving like Osama bin Laden at the time. So, um, yeah, man, just something, and, and, you know, uh, no one's talking about things like that in, in hip hop at the time. So I just, my mind is, million different places yeah and, and also around this time and it continues till today and the brand new heavies maybe helped kick it off but what was it about you uh having such an international following and being able to collaborate perform do all these things internationally um you know throughout your whole career um well we uh, the first international trip we took was 93 um, we went to, in 94, actually, we went to Germany, um, and did a show there. And then we didn't do a whole lot. We did Switzerland and we did a couple of shows in, uh, London. Um, but, uh, the, the overseas stuff started happening, uh, early 2000s, like 2001 after the truth hurts. Mm -hmm. That's when, you know, the nineties, it was sporadic. It was more go do a show or two but not touring. There wasn't like a, a big touring thing in Europe, um, not, at least not for hip hop at, at the time. There wasn't enough of an established, you know, network of people uh, that was doing it like that. So um, 2001, that's when it really, you know, came into play. We went over to Europe. We did six weeks um, over there, our first tour, very dope. We got to see a lot of countries. So that's what kind of started the collaborations with, with Europe and, you know, and, and at the time, 2001, everyone could get into shows in uh, Europe, mainly in Germany at 16. So 
we created a whole new audience of fans that were teenagers in Europe at that time when we started going in the early 2000s. So now uh, people will come to a show and they're 30 something. And it's like, how was that your show when I was 16, bro? And it's like, wow, you know what I'm saying? So um, it just, you know, we created a whole new fan base in Europe that appreciated the 90s and what we were doing with real hip hop. And they, you know, breathed life into us and kept it, kept it going. Yeah. And uh, soon thereafter, of course, you started doing a lot of the collaborative projects, whether it was, you know, Pete Rock or Master Ace or et cetera. So as you continued, what made you want to explore doing these collaborative projects? I mean, just as an artist, you know, you can't just keep putting out album, album, new album. What's special? What what makes people want to purchase it or listen to it? Um, so, you know, my first collaborative um, was, yeah, with Pete Rock. And actually, uh, that was the first one we did. And then I had did another one uh, called Wishful Thinking with a producer, a local producer here, um, DJ Supreme One. And then Special Teams came. So that was a collaborative group. Um, and then Master Ace. And I had, and after that, well, a lot of people will know I had a group called Four Peace, which was more of a community-based rap group. But we did tons and tons of things with, with, with kids and with um, communities, with prisons, with Yale. Um, so, you know, I just, I think as an artist, you have to grow. And, you know, work, doing collaborative albums helps you grow, helps you, you know, build more relationships, working with other people. Um, so you keep it exciting. It's not just another album, another album, another album, another album. You know, it's an album with Master A. So it's an album with special teams or with Pete Rock. Then it's a solo album. Then it's another solo album. Then, you know, so it, it works. And I think my career, it's just, I've just been blessed to be able to work with these other um, great artists and, and do great work, you know what I'm saying? And the projects that I've done collaboratively, they're all classics to me, you know what I'm saying? Um, they all have uh, a lot of value to them. You know, they weren't just, let's do something to do something. It was thought out and, you know, it took time and I, I think they all came out dope. Yeah. So with, with Pete Rock in particular on Truth Hurts, you had him with Situation. So is that, yeah. how, is that how you that, built this relationship? Yeah. Yep, that was the first song um, I did. And then after that, uh, it was a few years. Actually, it was the next year because we put that out 2001. We started working on Truth Hurts 2002, but it didn't come out to 2004. And what was so, the play? Man, I mean, technology. At the time, we were still using CDs and cassettes. Um, so that was, we weren't sending MP3s over the internet you know, in 2001 and two. So I had to literally go to New York and listen to beats or he would mail me a tape or a CD. But mm -hmm. if I didn't like the shit that he sent, so it was just a back and forth, go to New York, go to his house, listen, then go to New York, record, you know, so that that's what took the, the two year period. It wasn't, you know, like now we could get it done in a week, a month. You know what I mean? Like it's so simple now but back then it was man we literally had to go to new york sit and pete is a is a he's a great guy but sometimes we'll go and he just play loops no beats like i don't got no beats we're just gonna listen to loops so we listen to the loops for four or five hours like you know so the the it just took a long time it wasn't a uh you know quick process back in the days yeah, very different now. Very different now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, one of the other times I we had talked, I remember you had also said you were at least exploring or hoping to or wanting to run for mayor of Boston. So yeah, in the future, in the future. Not right now. Um, still got to clean up a couple of things and get myself <laughs> all right. Um, but yeah, in the future, I, I definitely would would definitely think about that, man. Um, why not? You know, who better to run the city than me? <laughs> Shit. Well, break it down. What What are you going to bring to Boston that it needs? 
or what would you bring? Well, I, I mean, obviously, uh, affordable housing is the top priority, and um, cleaning up. We got a bad, bad drug problem too now. A um, lot of homeless, a lot of drugs, like stuff we've never seen in ever. You know, where people are literally shooting drugs out in the open now. You know, so. Um, those things would, would need to be addressed first and, you know, foremost housing for people and, um, everything else in Boston, you know, is, is pretty, pretty cool. It's a chill city. You can make money. You can get a good job. Schools are pretty good. Um, so everything else is, is pretty, pretty fair right now. I'm happy with my city. Okay. Besides the rent, the rent is, is just number three in the country only behind Frisco and, you know, New York. Um, it's insanity. Wow. That is crazy. And uh, as you had said about adapting and making things interesting, I also remember too, uh, we had talked briefly about this back in the day, but after all these years, uh, you were doing the Kickstarter for that project as well. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I wanted, you know, how did you understand or when did you understand some people reject or don't want to be involved in evolving technology but it seems from what i know at least parts of it that you're willing to embrace it try it you know do stuff so back in the oh, day oh yeah i'm all about it so what all about what, it. what made you what made you like that i'm basically a sci-fi nerd um you know i'm i'm all about um all of that stuff so i've been into that since star wars and you know since since a kid back in the 70s so i've always wanted to explore see what else is there what else is is out here so um been a fan of that and been a big fan of technology um because it kind of coincides with sci-fi you know with, with everything that goes with that so um man when once stuff started happening and you know we we it was a new medium for us to do things and to reach more people um I was definitely all all for it, man. So, um, you know, I, as far as uh, I forgot the question too, because I went into something else. But what well, was no, the it, question? It, it was just that some people don't like to embrace technology, or they're always worried oh. about what how great things used to be. But like, oh yeah, yeah for yeah. someone like yourself, embracing Kickstarter back in the day for you know after all these years, I was like, wow, you know, Ed OG's been out since the early '90s, and here he is. 2014, I think it was, embracing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because it was a new medium. And I wanted to see, you know, if the if my fans would really support me. I mean, you're really not ever going to know if people are going to support you or not, you know, until you do something like that. And it's in big red letters. You either reach your goal or you don't. You know what I mean? So I wanted to kind of test myself to see if I still if people were still interested in what I was doing and if they were supported by spending some money, you know, and they did. And I was uh, very happy um, about it. And it actually helped me start my own label, Fifth and Union, um, off of that. And, you know, I've been putting out all my releases under, you know, my own banner since then. And it's been a great thing, man. Yeah. and. And along the way, what do you think has helped make you a good businessman in addition to a good artist? Um, just experience, man. I think experience going through the roller coaster of the rap world, um, you know, being up, down, up, down, up, down, plateau when you start, you know. So um, it's just, I just think I've reached a point being in it, you know, for 31 years and even longer. Uh, you know, when I wasn't professional, um, it's just the experience. I think that teaches you everything uh, you need to know. And, you know, I teach to younger cats. I always tell them, you know, start your own label, start your own label first, be independent, do it on yourself, learn how it works. And then you'll be a better artist and a better, you know, overall businessman, because, you know, business is, a, a huge part of it and you know if you're just an artist then those are the people who get screwed most of the time 
Well, that's why it's called the music business. They go hand in hand. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, there it is. Well, Ed OG, uh, what should people be looking out for you for now and coming up soon? Oh, man. Well, last year I put out a collab, another collaborative album. Uh, let me bring this up. The Insight Innovates? Ed OG and Insight Innovates. Yes. Grab this album. Um, super dope record uh we got a song on there called um surrey but we embraced i had my man insight and i know i know we're wrapping this up but just to get, let the people know more embracing of technology we did a song with surrey so she's featured in the song we're rapping she's coming back with what we're saying you know and that and and the whole beat was made out of iphone sounds so it's a really dope interesting um record i think we're probably gonna do a animated video or something to it so we can just get that out there um but yeah interesting song that was the last record i put out last may we got a new album coming out this year solo album uh ed og and the bulldogs album coming in this year <clears throat> um a lot of collaborative projects i work with this guy named dj yoda in uk and uh uh balloon which is a producer out there in the UK. We got a collaborative album, another collaborative album with my guy in Austria. Just working, 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 man. So a lot of stuff coming out this year. Really excited. About, you know, more, more music and more, more things to drop, man. Yes. Well, congratulations on all that. And I look forward to hearing it as been listening forever. So appreciate it, brother. Yeah, well, there it is. Ed OG, thanks for coming through to Unique Access, man. I appreciate it. Salute, Soren. I will talk with you soon, my brother. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangsta Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice-T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangsta Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip-hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, Bob, on your TV back with that anyway? Yo MTV, it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.